Our next guest we're bringing on is Prem Thacker, who is a politics reporter at The Intercept and is a, refor- a former reporter at The New Republic. So welcome, Prem. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me. Of hello, course. Everyone. Thanks for joining. Absolutely. I wanted to start off by playing uh, an interaction that you had with Matthew Miller of the State Department. Here's a clip of you asking him about a Haaretz article on Israeli kill zones. But before we show that clip, can you just provide some background about what this article revealed? Yeah, yeah. So this this article, um, as many uh, folks might have seen, it came out a couple of days ago. And at a very basic level, it, it talked about um, sort of this procedure in which um, Israeli soldiers were sort of empowered to, or, or directed rather, to um, pretty much fire at functionally anything that moves, as my colleague Nick Terse um, writes about the Vietnam War right. um, in in in, the, in these zones. Um, so anyone that isn't identified as an Israeli soldier um, to fire upon them. Um, so of course that includes, you know, not anyone, not just anyone that they might think of as being Hamas, but that means anyone. Um, and and this reporting that came from Haaretz was kind of affirming a lot of instances we've seen up to this point of of you know it seems like every day we hear reports of. Palestinians being sniped in the streets. Um, there were uh, lots of reports a few weeks ago and months ago of, of uh, Palestinians in, in the church complex and hospitals um, being seemingly flippantly targeted at. But then once the story came out, it, it started to, you know, um, affirm this idea that perhaps there are these specific zones in which um, Israeli soldiers are just empowered to just shoot on sight. Um, so that's sort of the, the pretext for this question. Um, and I might, I might also add just for a second that Said Arakat, he he had asked about this first, um, and I chose to follow just because um, Matt Miller had said that they had not seen evidence of, of this thing during his answer. So I wanted to sort of follow up upon that. Got it. And Said Arakat is great, and he's been on the show. So lovely. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at this. I want to follow up on Said's question about the reports of kill zones in Gaza. Uh, you said that you know you haven't seen evidence of such a thing. But, you know, we've seen, for instance, the two Palestinians who were waving white flags killed just days ago. We've seen repeated reports of Israeli snipers killing people outside of hospitals, people afraid to even walk into the streets to save people who are bleeding out. Um, so it seems understandable to say, you know, we've seen reports, Israel denied it, we'll look into it. But to outright say there's, there's not evidence of Israel establishing some form of, of this kind of practice, does, does that seem you know, preliminary to, to say that kind of thing? No, we've not seen evidence of, of what was what that was reported in this article. Now, have we seen uh, a number of incidents of civilian harm? Of course we have. We have seen those, and that happens in, in every war. Uh, and I can tell you what we have said before, which is we take those incredibly seriously. We have engaged with the government of Israel to set, to make clear that uh, those accounts need to be investigated. And if, if soldiers are found to have operated in violation of either uh, the IDF code of conduct or international humanitarian law, they need to be disciplined. What do you, do you think of his response there? I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily aberrant from what has been said before on any number of suspected human rights violations Israel has committed in the past six months. Um, one thing that I think makes this more interesting is that this sort of deference to, you know, where we have to engage with the government of Israel, we have to follow the investigation and and, and, and go from there. Um, of course, that is kind of a line that they've drawn throughout this conflict. Um, but obviously one key sort of issue with this line being repeated over and over again is that we get that first part of saying we want the investigation to occur. And putting aside the, the idea that it might be problematic for the alleged perpetrator to investigate itself, putting that aside, um, they express that they're interested in investigation. Um, and beyond that, that is where it kind of ends. For instance, I've asked for weeks now about the two-month-old now killing of Hindrajab, the little six-year-old girl, um, her family, the medics that were sent to save her. Six-year-old Hind Rajab was trying to get to the west of Gaza City last month when the car she was traveling in came under fire. At the time, there were calls released by the Palestine Red Crescent Society to emergency call operators of the young girl calling for help, saying she was scared, asking for someone to come and get her. Similarly, a horrifying kind of uh, alleged atrocity as to the, the seven aid workers insofar as this was a seemingly pretty intentional attack, given that 
Uh, these were medics. They were sort of identified as such. And um, paramedics did try to get to the young girl, but there was more, more gunfire and the call line went dead. Red Crescent workers finally got to the area today. And here's the video that's come in of what they found. This video shows the black Kia that she was in destroyed, riddled with bullets. Hind was among six bodies found inside this car, along with her aunt, her uncle, and her three cousins. Also, we can show you the mangled ambulance that was dispatched to save her. Two paramedics who were trying to get to the young girl were also found with this uh, vehicle. Now, the Palestine Red Crescent Society says that they tried to coordinate with the Israeli army access to get in safely to get the young girl out. In a statement, they say, despite prior coordination to allow the ambulance to reach the location to rescue Hind, the occupation deliberately targeted the Palestine Red Crescent ambulance crew. There is no reason, as far as we can tell, for, for even this family to be attacked. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we've asked about this weeks on end. I've asked about it over and over and over again, about something that I've described in one of my questions as a pretty, you know, I'm no military expert. I'm, I'm just a boy. But in terms of how you would investigate such a case where there is emergency phone call, um, audio transcriptions, there's timestamps, um, there's footage of where exactly the, this incident took place took place. If you were someone that were privy to, to this information and was involved in this conflict in any way, even if you were on the United States, who is technically not involved, you could probably connect the dots pretty easily enough to figure out which soldiers were involved. You could interview other soldiers um, who might have been on the communication lines, um, any of the commanders on duty at the time. That is just one example of, of many in which if that investigation were a priority, it would not take, I think today is day 64. Uh, uh, since um, Hindraja was killed. Um, so we kind of see this pattern over and over and over again where uh, these atrocities are, are seen, are, are documented on footage or through reporting, whether it's from outlets like Haaretz to, you know, of course, you know, the many brave journalists on the ground in Gaza. Um, but regardless, it, it kind of stays in that limbo where they express an interest in the investigation, um, but it doesn't generally move forward from there. And there have been, of course, certain instances where the IDF says uh, outright, this was our bad, um, but we don't have any sort of measured accountability, even for those individual cases in which seemingly soldiers are held, held accountable. We don't have any sort of way of understanding, A, how many soldiers are implicated in these violations, and then B, any sort of accounting publicly of how many of them have actually been sort of held to account, faced consequences. Um, no less, of course, obviously the elephant in the room being uh, the question of military aid. Um, right. So that, that's sort of my reaction to, to that and, and sort of many other answers me and a lot of our colleagues have, have received in the briefing room. You also had an interesting interaction right after we're going to play this right now where you asked about the attacks on Al-Shifa Hospital. Let's take a look at what Matthew Miller had to say there. On Al Shifa Hospital, I know you've talked at, at some length about it, but I'm just wondering. You know, we've gone from months ago the idea of Israeli forces targeting hospital to being, you know, outlandish to now they've done this um, attack on Al Shifa, and statedly and ostensibly they say that you know they've killed um, Hamas terrorists. Nevertheless, you know, we've seen reports of kids, women found gruesomely killed, executed. Reportedly, even a surgeon who was there for 172, 172 days, excuse me, treating patients killed. Um, and, you know, some victims, we can't even confirm their, their identity because of the, the state of their bodies. So I'm wondering, you know, given this attack, given the evident lack of care for civilians, given that we can't get an update on investigations into, for instance, the now two-month killing of Hind, um, the medic sent to save her, how can the U.S. approve, you know, any action in Tarafa, a slice of land where, you know, 1.1 million Palestinians are seeking refuge? If, if, if a targeted attack on a hospital looks yeah. like this, what would an attack so, in any form on Rafa look like? Uh, again... <clears throat> Do not believe that this attack was on the hospital. It, the attack was on the Hamas fighters that are hiding inside a hospital. Sure, but that's, that's sort of my some, point. Some place that they should never be. But it makes you make a good point with respect to Rafah, which is why we have made clear we don't want to see a full-scale military operation. But I think the 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 premise of the question. I, I shouldn't say I shouldn't say the premise of the question. I don't want to attribute this to you. But the other alternative is that Israel does nothing about the Hamas fighters 
that continue to exist uh, in Rafa. And we don't think that's an acceptable alternative either. So what we have said is there needs to be a targeted military operation in Rafa that targets the Hamas fighters in a way that minimizes civilian harm uh, and not a full-scale uh, operation. That's been what, we've, what we have been making clear to them. Just one small follow-up on that, uh, if you'll allow. Um, I guess this just gets to a broader question about, you know, where, what does the U.S. see as sort of the path out of here? Like, is it political? Because what does it mean for Israel to defend itself ongoingly? Like, is it a matter of eradicating everyone who is associated with Hamas? Because that, I don't know, yeah. it doesn't necessarily seem like a goal that has led to the protection of civilians up to this point. So there, needs, they have, there need to be battlefield successes, and there needs to be a political path forward. And that is what we have been engaged with partners in the region uh, to develop and ultimately to present to Israel. Because as you have heard the secretary say, without a political path forward for the Palestinian people, Israel and the Palestinians are going to be stuck in this same cycle of violence that they have been stuck in for decades. And that's not in the Palestinian people's interest, as we have seen over the past nearly six months. It is not in Israel's interest, as we saw very clearly on October 7th. And so that is the work that we are doing inside the United States government to try to develop that political path forward that we think ultimately is in the best interests of the Palestinian people, the Israeli people, and the broader uh, region at large. He presents this dichotomy where the choices are bomb hospitals or do nothing about Hamas. I don't think anyone takes that seriously. Yeah, yeah, it's especially interesting because, I mean, I'm not going to attribute this to him, but, you know, there are a lot of people who, on one hand, say the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very complicated. You know, you can't just sort of have one, put your stake in, in one side or the other. You need to have nuance, which, you know, sure, whatever. Um, I think there are certain parts of it that surely, of course, given historical com context and so on, make it complicated, but there are certain parts that I think just through observing and, and, and watching and listening and learning, uh, yes, are, are less complicated. But but be that as may, uh, that be that as it may, given that there are a good amount of people that say, "Oh, it's complicated," and then a lot of those people then also say, "Well, what do you do? Either you bomb them or you don't. And if you don't, then they're going to bomb you." Which, um, you know, there's a lot of issues with that formulation. But one is just that what I was trying to get at in that question that I kind of clumsily threw out at the end was that. If indeed the United States is interested in a political solution, which seemingly they they say they are and seemingly would be beneficial for everyone involved, th their actions at the moment don't seem to make sense insofar as beyond just the fact that they continue to supply the Israeli government with weapons seemingly on demand, uh, billions in aid. Beyond that, again, putting that aside, um, to express willingness to approve or support or get behind some form of an incursion into Rafa, while also saying that you are working with regional partners to achieve a ceasefire, is seemingly pretty blatantly counterproductive insofar as that makes the timeline so ambiguous. You know, if you're working towards a ceasefire, which weeks ago Biden was implying that that was going to be right on the corner, um, that's something that I think me and my colleagues could do a better job at falling back up on. Um, Given that momentary, I think it was right before, I think maybe we had even talked about this right before the Michigan primaries, um, that, you know, they had insinuated that a uh, ceasefire right. was coming. But to to somehow imply that a ceasefire is is impending, but then to continue to express to Israel that, yeah, come with come to us with a plan about Rafa and we'll see about it. Um, for, for Palestinians and I guess even for the political arm of Hamas, how are they supposed to interpret that? And how are they supposed to interpret negotiations for a ceasefire in good faith if they are seeing that willingness to invade Rafa um, is also on the table? Because then it's a question of what's the order? Is the idea that they should uh, the United States would be interested in, in Israel invading Rafa before the ceasefire? Is it to come after the ceasefire? In which case, I, I don't think Hamas would, would want to agree to a ceasefire because that would functionally make the ceasefire a, another temporary pause. Um, so I think that is a, a very blatantly counterproductive um, part of where the United States is standing right now. Um, and that's just been kind of flagrantly on my mind, um, because, I mean, I'm not speaking as a representative of Hamas, obviously. I'm just sort of, if we are to play this whole real politique game, just going from those 
um, sort of bargaining chips and just realities, why would one entity agree to a ceasefire if it seems as if this, this option to invade a slice of land where 1.1 million people are is on the table? Um, so that's kind of been one contradiction that's been on my mind throughout all this, especially, you know, with regards to answers that, that we see from the State Department and the White House and so on.